Hello, I'm Dirk Smith, Shell's Corporate Chief Scientist. And today I'm going to talk to you about how to accelerate the energy transition to a net zero emission system and why companies like Shell are crucial to achieve this. I'm a scientist myself. I started out as a string theorist and was destined to stay in science if it were not for something in my personal life due to which I decided to go back to the Netherlands. So I ended up at Shell and now I work already for the company for over 30 years. But I never severed the ties with university. I am a university fellow at MIT and a professor of physics of energy at the Indian Institute of Science and I lecture at both on aspects of scaling up net zero systems. I'm deeply fascinated how humankind has progressed by finding and developing ever more ingenious ways to use more powerful energy sources and through them improve standards of living. In many ways humankind follows what nature has found out through evolution and physics is very helpful to explain and to understand what the dominant source of energy is in the universe. For example, when you look up to the night sky through a telescope and you see a lot of stars, all these stars shine because of nuclear fusion. It is in fact the de facto standard energy source of the universe. I argue that also here on Earth we are inching forward towards eventually using fusion energy in our societies. It's the cleanest and possibly the most abundantly available and very efficient energy source. But we're not there yet. Fusion indeed is a few decades away. And we cannot wait for it in our efforts to hold global warming through the use of fossil fuels. It's very clear, also in Shell, that we want to have more of these. There's no debate that we really need to scale up renewables, in particular solar PV and wind, beyond a scale that some probably would argue is unbelievable or unrealistic. What however is an issue is that when you start to get out of your lab working on, for example, materials for photovoltaic conversions into the real world and think about scale up, then all of a sudden there are three things that you need to worry about and they're all equally important. I organize these in a triangle called the energy policy triangle. The environment refers today to global warming effects. This is a systemic problem at affecting every citizen on the planet. It therefore sets the scale at which this energy transition needs to happen. But also in time, climate scientists tell us that by 2050 we have to reach the Paris agreements. That means, in essence, that a transition that affects presumably 60% at least of the global population is required to go through the energy transition. This also means that it is unlikely that we will get very far fast enough by only looking at local initiatives and then forget how they link to each other. Climate scientists know that and hence put a lot of effort to show how a particular pathway can be constructed by integrating several local initiatives that would technically achieve the Paris goals in time. However, in everyday life, large societies also think about the cost and the effort, which is reflected by the other vertex, economics. Energy production and provision is very capital intensive. Hence likely not all pathways that are technically feasible can be turned into business models equally fast or fast enough. And even if they are equally fast, then the population may also worry about security of the supply of energy, which is for example sadly illustrated by the war in Ukraine, which led to a cutoff in gas supplies to Europe, and in fact is now a global problem to the energy security. Hence societies need to find an optimum trade-off among all three in order to scale up. Focusing on one aspect will not help us because it will lead to delay. At the end of the day, the only way to scale in a free society requires economically sound pathways, which may require significant governmental incentives to help achieve businesses to change. If it comes to scale up solar and wind, then one of the things that you're hit by is that they take a lot of space. That is because the so-called power density of wind and solar is very low. In fact, very much lower than, let's say, of energy stored in hydrocarbons whether they're fossil or synthetic, or whether you use nuclear energy. And as you can see here, what happens if you replace oil by hydrogen, for example, produced by green electrons, i.e. from solar and wind, you need a lot of wind and solar area to build 
the same amount of power. You can calculate how much area in fact and compare this perhaps with other clean options. You see on the same map a little dot somewhere with an arrow pointing at it. That's the footprint of a nuclear reactor producing the same amount of hydrogen via its energy. There is nothing fundamentally against building large wind farms of course. But they do take a lot of solid material as well. Concrete, steel and glass. In fact all renewables take up comparable amounts of solid materials. Hydro dams, wind, farms about the same and solar about one and a half times more. It will just take time therefore to convince everyone to build this. In general this is about ten times more material needed for wind farms and solar farms than our oil and gas based energy production systems require today for the same amount of energy produced. This drives up the infrastructural costs. And then there is the fact that solar and wind are intermittent supply systems. And at large scale this intermittency has surprising effects. For example in California about 20 gigawatt of previously installed natural gas based power has been substituted now by solar PV and wind. However unlike with natural gas, the installed capacity is much less used on average and also shows large variations. 50% of the installed capacity is only used 22% of the time in a year. And furthermore, for about 10% of the time in a year, no energy is generated at all. Because the wind doesn't blow or, as in California, the solar panels get too hot to function. To remedy this we need massive amounts of storage, as indeed a sizable fraction of the annual energy production, which adds up further to the cost of the energy infrastructure. So it becomes clear that you want to build infrastructure with the best conditions, probably at the most advantaged sites. And for solar PV this would likely favor desert environments. In a desert, in particular closer to the equator, the solar radiation is fantastic. And there is of course lots of empty space. And furthermore, as you may know, the thermodynamics of direct solar radiation shows that you do not need a lot of solar panels to power the entire energy system. The energy system on Earth is actually not all that large compared to the amount of usable solar photons that the sun dumps on us every day. In fact, you need only half a million square kilometers of solar panels. That may sound a lot, and maybe it is, but it fits easily in almost any desert on Earth. But what is not so clear is that they are far from where we live. And one of the problems with electricity is that it doesn't transport very well beyond 1200 kilometers. Or it doesn't transport as cheaply as it does for shorter distances. And you need cables for this. Furthermore, electricity is not easily stored in large amounts over long time frames. Indeed if you do not use a battery for example, it still leaks its energy. This is unavoidable. Long term storage of large amounts of energy is not a friend of an electron. Or let's say a very costly friend of an electron. Partial solutions exist of course and battery technologies will advance very rapidly no doubt. But they will always put a fundamental constraint on the flexibility and optionality of how to get energy from a desert farm to consumers far away at an affordable rate. And the cost rise beyond 1200 kilometers and the storage cost of large let's say terawatt hour scale over seasonal time scales, several months say, become almost unaffordable. Which means that the infrastructure of a solar PV or wind farm is in essence only possible by a market or by consumers that live nearby these solar and wind farms. Let's say within a range of 1200 to 1500 kilometers. So we are faced with a transport problem if we really want to scale up a lot of renewables. And furthermore, the storage problem, to cope with the intermittency for example, is likely most serious for heavy industries that typically operate on small profit margins and require lots of power and energy. There's not a whole lot of tolerance for intermittency for industrial clients. Fortunately, nature shows you what a solution could be. Namely, fatty acids, if you wish, or for the chemist, linear hydrocarbon chains. What you see here is a godwit, and this bird has the ability to fly non-stop 11,000 kilometers. It does so with an absolute phenomenal efficiency. And also, it does something that very few planes are able to do. Namely, at takeoff, 
it uses about 50% of its bird's weight for fuel for the entire route. That may sound a lot, but it really isn't as it allows you to fly for over 190 hours non-stop covering these 11,000 kilometers. And its efficient flying allows it to cover this with only this small amount of fuel. Because the fuel is in fact of very high energy density. And why is that? Well, nature has actually shown to us that linear hydrocarbon chains, or for that matter these three structures that you see here on the left, called fatty acids, are actually a very good way to store energy. And the fact that you can store energy at arbitrary timescales, in chemical bonds, they don't lose their energy, means that you can actually make the route very optimal and given the circumstances can decide on breaks or fly a little longer or shorter. Shell in the past has actually developed this concept into a synthetic process, higher olefins, um, that actually builds on the same premise. It can in fact be used as kerosene. What I'm actually getting at is that rather than perhaps focusing entirely on direct electrification of the energy system, chemical energy carriers, not for making products but for transport and storage of energy, will help to overcome the storage and transport limitations provided by electricity. Hence all of a sudden production of renewables at advantage sites, far away from where we live perhaps, can now be transported to any consumer in the world. So what we see is that with chemical energy carriers we create optionality and flexibility in an energy system such that demand and supply of energy can be dynamically adjusted in very flexible and with great optionality and therefore can be optimized to the lowest possible cost to large numbers of consumers. And as every economist will tell you, this is a sure way to achieve scale fast. That's not to say that direct electrification of energy is without merit. If you're able to build solar farms and wind farms close to where you live, for sure you would do this. But this will only address a rather small fraction of the energy needed for an entire society and will not be affordable, for example, for large industries. So let's see what this means for a future net zero emissions energy system. We realize now that we're not so much focusing on the primary energy source, renewables, maybe nuclear, but need to focus on the chemical energy carriers in addition to electrical energy carriers, not to replace each other, but adding to each other. And of course, we have to make these carriers cleanly like hydrogen, ammonia, methanol, and synthetic hydrocarbon change. We need to do so in an energy system that doesn't contain any fossil hydrocarbons. This is indeed technically very well possible. And this optionality and flexibility made possible by chemical energy carriers creates a much more customer-centric energy system and allows us to driving down costs for a multitude, in fact for all energy consumers. One may wonder, of course, if this will get us to scale fast enough, that is, in time for Paris. Well, I do believe that it can. Why? Well, that's because what the energy industry, or more specifically, the oil and gas industry, has done over the last six decades. Most people, of course, identify fossil hydrocarbon industries with the fact that it deals with fossil resources. And to a degree, that's very well justified and true. But what made this industry big and big so fast is the fact that it solved the transportability and storability of energy on a truly global scale. With the transport and storage problem solved, cost has come down by essentially an allowing concentration of production at advantage sites, at a few advantage sites in fact. 90% of all oil today comes out of just less than 40 super basins. These are these red balls here that you see here. Now, what does this mean for renewables now? Well, incidentally, some of these super basins are also very good sites to actually build out wind farms and solar farms. That is not true for every super basin, of course. But for those where it is, it's extremely advantaged to consider this very seriously. For example, in the North Sea or in the Gulf of Mexico, or for that matter, the deserts in, uh, in the Middle East. These basins might be very good starting points to scale renewables because there's a lot of chemical factories around there that you might actually use to produce cleanly these chemical energy carriers. A lot of these chemical energy carriers are already produced for products perhaps, not for transport or for storage. 
but that's something that might be feasible with an infrastructure that is already there to start with. And to just give you an example of what might very well uh, come to mind are, for example, offshore production platforms using and building on capabilities that exist in offshore engineering industries that are very good at that, where you could say you moor an ammonia factory in a wind farm to directly get access to the electricity or produce hydrogen for that matter. And that gets shipped then to either onshore or to faraway clients. Those things are not so inconceivable. You can use or start at least with existing infrastructure. And the knowledge to modify this is not so outlandish. You don't have to start from scratch. Well, this brings me to the close of this, uh, of this talk. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you agree now with me that chemical energy carriers are vital for scale-up of a net zero emission system in which renewables will probably be the dominant energy source. In order to achieve that, we need much more flexibility and optionality of how we transport and how we store energy, much more, in fact, than is possible with direct electrification only. But in particular, we need to solve uh, inhibitors to scale provided by direct electrification of our energy system for some time to come. And I hope that I convince you because of that insight and because of the engineering and the flexibility and optionality that we can therefore create in a net zero emission energy system, companies like Shell are probably very good or probably even crucial to help achieve that in the shortest possible time frame, simply because the oil and gas industry has done this before.